Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm Director of Expression at Open Society Foundations and formerly Editor-in-Chief of this fine media site, Open Democracy. Um, today joining us is Oliver Bullo, journalist and author of uh, a book which we're going to be discussing, Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Collectocrats and Criminals, very timely, um, and also Moneyland, which is an excellent book I highly recommend too. Um, we have um, Peter Gagan, Editor-in-Chief of Open Democracy and author of Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dirty Politics, um, many of, of the yarns that um, that we spun over many, many years working together at Open Democracy. And finally, we have Koju Karam, who's um, a writer and academic um, teaching at the School of Law at Birkbeck um, and editor of The War on Drugs and the Global Colour Line, as well as author of Uncommonwealth, um, Uncommonwealth, uh, Britain and the Aftermath of Empire. This is a really, really great um, panel. I'm so glad that you're spending the time with us today. Um, we actually dreamed up this discussion well uh, before uh, the tragic events in Ukraine because we were here to talk about Oliver's wonderful, well-written book um, about how Britain became butler of the world, how it, how it lost an empire and, and found a new job, um, butlering. Um, so I think I wanted to start uh, with Oliver. And Oliver, I just wanted to ask you really what the impetus was for writing this book and, and why people should read it, <laughs> um, why it's important now. And um, people, please do add your thoughts, comments, questions in the chat. Thank you to everyone who submitted them ahead of time. I'll try and get them as many as, as, as I can throughout the discussion, but wanted to kick off with Oliver. Thanks, Mary, and thanks everyone for being here uh, to listen. I don't know how it is where you are, but it's a gorgeous evening, so it's lovely that you've chosen to be with us rather than outside in the park or something. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, a, Russia, a Russophile, a Russianist by training. I worked as a journalist in Russia for many years um, and in the former Soviet Union more broadly. And over the years, I mean, some might say it took me rather too long to notice it, I became increasingly concerned by corruption by the effect that corruption was having on almost everything. Um, it made everything that was bad worse and impeded the development of everything that was good in all the countries that I cared about. Um, and the more I looked at corruption, the more I thought that essentially the common understanding of corruption was wrong. You know, if we look at the Corruption Perceptions Index from, from Transparency International, countries are rated by how corrupt they are. You know, mm. each country is given a score, you know, 84, 6, whatever, with, you know, South Sudan down the bottom and Denmark up at the top. And yet, if you look at how money flows, that, that isn't what, how corruption works at all. Corruption moves mm. between countries. Corruption is totally international, transnational. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, essentially that the, the common understanding of corruption is not just misleading. It's also very unfair. It's blaming people um for being corrupt when they are very much only part of the problem or may in fact themselves be the victims and the more i looked into this the more concerned i became that whatever the scam was there's always a british mm -hmm. role there's always british fingerprints on it um and uh and that's where butler to the world came from really i, I mm -hmm. the idea the title came from a chat i had with an american academic who was very um interested in what Britain was doing to fight Chinese money laundering. And he kept asking me about how we could get in touch with people doing all these things that are fairly routine in America, like investigating money laundering and prosecuting it and making a noise politically about it. And I had to disabuse him and say none of those things were happening. Um, and I was trying to explain why none of those things are happening. I said, we well, have to understand, you know, Britain isn't the policeman of the world. That's what America does. Um, we don't investigate wrongdoing. We help criminals get away with wrongdoing. We're the butler to the world. And, you know, a lot of what Britain does, you know, moving dirty money, helping crooks get away with things. It, it sounds like a, you know, the kind of thing a conciliary would do to a, to a mafia don. Um, but, but that has the wrong image. You know, that's the conciliary we all know from mafia movies is someone who's sort of in the back room of an Italian restaurant in Brooklyn. You know, that's very much not what's going on here. This is all in plain sight, people with perfect accents, impeccable tailoring, you know, their manners are fine. They can all, you know, speak in multiple languages. They can quote the classics and so on. So conciliary is wrong, which is why I thought Butler, you know, this like Jeeves. We're, we've, we've become a, a dark Jeeves helping uh, the world's kleptocrats uh, and criminals get away with whatever it is they want to get away with. And I don't think this gets nearly enough attention. But I mean, the last three or four, four weeks has been a, a real turnaround, to be honest, in that we've finally come to terms with what we've been doing for the Russian oligarchs and how we've been helping Russian oligarchs to navigate the global financial system and get away with 
stealing well the whole country really as well as destabilize other countries um and that's great you know it's really good that there's this debate about what we've been doing for russian oligarchs but you know this isn't only a russia problem britain isn't only butler to the russians uh, it's butler to the world so we need to move beyond recognizing that we've been helping uh, the russian oligarchs destroy their own country and destabilize their neighbors we've also been helping um oligarchs from uh, ukraine uh, azerbaijan kazakhstan nigeria angola malaysia you name it we've been helping them do it um and it's a pretty shameful story really um and uh, something that we need to stop doing i think if we want to make the world a better place thank you yes and i wanted to come back to that in light of boris johnson's uh, re recent little jaunt to, to Riyadh as well um but <laughs> yeah. uh, we can talk about that in a moment i think just picking with staying with that theme of empire for now um i mean what you your book um tells in a very lively way um is the story of how our identity changed from imperial power or master to, to, to butler. Um, but actually, Kojo has written this wonderful piece for Open Democracy, which I encourage everyone to read, um, where he talks about how uh, so much of what's going on is, is, is a product of empire that still exists, and that actually those in power have, have systematically sought to deny. Um, so Kojo, do you want to say a bit about that, about that, that empire that still exists in, in your formulation? Um, well, thank you all for inviting me on this panel. And it's wonderful to be in conversation with Oliver, whose work on this, I think, has really mapped out the terrain of how Britain reinvented its role in the global financial system in the aftermath of empire, you know, from the workshop of the world to the butler of the world, as he, as he illustrates. And um, I think that we need to really kind of dig through the story in the way that it's often ignored. We think about the role that America played in the kind of post-war economic order, we talk about the role that America pretty legitimately did play in terms of the construction of neoliberalism on a global scale, but we don't think about how much of the wealth that continues to be accumulated and extracted around the world flows through the legal, financial, and banking systems of the City of London, and most crucially also overseas territories. Um, I really wanted to tie that into the wider story of empire by putting it in conversation with the recent focus that we've had on empire, perhaps ever since the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020 and the pulling down of the Edward Colson statue. Um, ever since then, we've discussed this idea of decolonization almost ad nauseum. Um, you know, we've talked about the decolonization of curriculum, we've talked about the decolonization of our artistic institutions, our museums, and we've constantly focused on this issue really within the realm of the cultural sphere. Um, and I think this has been very comfortable for politicians who have had a vested interest in portraying Britain's imperial legacy as something that's primarily another issue of identity politics, another issue of the culture wars. But when we look into the kind of issues that Oliver and myself have been touching upon, we can see that there's a much more material legacy of the British Empire that continues to encourage wealth inequality all around the world. We can look at things like the non-dom tax rule established in order to allow individuals to be able to not be taxed on the property that they accrued in the colonies. And that is now benefiting not just Russian oligarchs, but as Oliver said, Nigerian, Saudi, Chinese billionaires, and of course, British billionaires as well. And in terms of the, um, the kind of ghost of empire still haunting the way in which wealth is offshored around the world, we really need to look at the way that, according to someone like the Tax Justice Network, the top three corporate tax havens that exist in the world today are all British overseas territories, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, and Bermuda. Their re, kind of re, 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 like, um, kind of representing themselves as offshore financial centers is really tied to the wider era of decolonization in the 1960s, as a lot of the other members of what used to be the old British West Indies transitioned into independent sovereign states like Jamaica, which is actually how the Cayman Islands was governed during the era of empire. Places like the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands established new constitutions and were able to present themselves as the main hideouts for kleptocratic wealth all across the world. And they were able to do that because they stayed under the umbrella of British sovereignty. They adopted this kind of in-out position where they were half in in order to be able to give people around the world 
the confidence that their wealth would be protected by the strength of the English common law, but half out enough to be able to represent themselves as distant from the kind of democratic demands of social welfareism of mid 20th century Britain. And so these legacies are things that we wanna talk about for me a lot more than we wanna talk about the statues and the songs and all of the more cultural elements of the British imperial legacy. And I think that the um, current crisis in Ukraine has finally brought attention onto this part of the British imperial legacy. Thank you, Kojo. And Open Democracy has been doing a stellar job uh, exposing how many elements of this system work, um, particularly the enabling industries that, that Oliver touches on when he describes butlering, and also the, the political connections, right? The, um, the way in which um, power is exercised through um, politics and political patronage. So, Peter, I wanted you to just come in and, and talk a little bit about how this works in practice, maybe to highlight some of the recent stories that Open Democracy have done, which really expose exactly how the system works. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, quite, um, uh, it's quite an opposite day to be talking about this. And I feel very honored to be talking after both Oliver and Kojo, who've written so well about, you know, about the kind of nest of the imperial nest and the way in which all of that has facilitated this, what, what I almost call democratic darkness. But I think it's really important as well to think about the, the, the nuts and bolts of that, the enablers, the fixers, the PR industry, you know, the lawyers. Um, and we're speaking on quite an interesting day, too, because the government, you might remember, many of our, our listeners might remember, about three or four months ago, an MP called Owen Patterson was forced eventually to resign in, in disgrace after breaking parliamentary rules on numerous occasions to do with his lobbying for two firms that paid him about uh, a quarter of a million, about, paid him about £500,000 over about four years to lobby for them. Um, uh, the government initially thought that this, they decided they wanted to keep him and um, they were going to bring down the standards commission to keep him. But in the end, he went and they said, we're going to change this system. We're going to change second jobs. Well, just today, we found out what they're going to do and they're going to do precisely nothing. They have said the government has now decided that it would be impractical to change the lobbying industry. And why does this matter for this conversation? Why does it matter whether MPs have second jobs for this conversation? It matters a great deal, actually. Jeffrey Cox, who is the MP who's paid the most by any of any MPs, a QC earns a fortune of over a million pounds as an MP over the last few years. He has represented some of these tax havens, the British Virgin Islands and other countries. So there's, you know, there's a kind of direct link into parliament to people like that in court cases. But also this, the lobbying industry and, and something a lot of MPs do both when they're in politics and also when they leave politics. So someone like Francis Maud, for example, a former cabinet minister now runs his own Francis Maud consult I think it's Francis Maud Associates, a consultancy firm selling public relations around the world. Again, often plugging into countries like Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, where Tony Blair did work as well after he left office. You can see there's a pattern here. We have a kind of constellation and nesting between um, our politicians, people who hold elected offices, and this entire world of law, uh, legal world, lobbying world, uh, PR world, that holds this dark, kind of democratic darkness in place. You know, you need someone to go and lobby on behalf of the Virgin Islands, and uh, there's many blue chip lobbying firms that are very happy to do so. So this, this whole enabling industry is completely key to this. And it's something that you can see here, right here in the city of London. I think, you know, just walk around somewhere like Mayfair, as I did the other day, and you will see all these little you know, kind of brass plaques for different consultancies, you know, and it all looks, you know, it's all nice, good chaps doing good things. But as we know, really what's going on is you're influencing and selling influence into government. And we know from the work that Open Democracy has done and others too, just how far up the political tree this goes. And I think it's been shocking. Uh, in some ways, what's been shocking for someone like me over the last three or four weeks is to watch all this pearl cut clutching. I saw Robert Preston tweeting about how, you know, as Warren Buffett says, when the sea goes out, you can see who's not wearing any underwear. And, you know, in, in relation to Russian money and British politics, you're saying like, we're now, all these questions are going to be asked of people who took Russian money. And it's like, well, it's on the register of interest. And, you could have asked questions about this at any time over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. It's, it's, it's not in some ways a great revelation. And I think one of the things that surprised me when I started writing about this sort of stuff three or four years ago, and I, I think probably both Oliver and Kojo share this thing, this similar sentiment where you're like, this stuff is a lot of, it's often in plain sight. You know, there's often, these are things that are just sitting there in plain sight, but no one has thought to ask too many questions about them. And I think this, this aspect of it, and then, 
the kind of the imbrication of our political system and our the money that runs through our political system and this world of dirty money, this world of you know of, of corruption, frankly, and call it what it is, and and this butlering that Oliver talks about so well in his book, this is completely connected to our politics. It's not something that just sits to a side of it that sits alongside it. This is absolutely key to it. And I'll leave you with one. Uh, one kind of uh, one example of this, which keys into it too, it feels like an example from many, many years ago, David Cameron and Greensill, the scandal of the year less than 12 months ago in which our former prime minister was lobbying directly for a company that he was working for. Yet again, they said at the time, the system will change. I remember writing a piece saying, surely the system will change now. Reader, I was wrong. We are still back where we were all those years ago. So many of the questions that have been asked both in the chat and um, submitted before this panel were versions of what can we do? What can be done? What can we do? What, what should Labour be doing? What should we as ordering citizens be doing? What should the government be doing? But I, and, and these are all questions I, I'd like to explore. Um, but I want to start with what the government claims it's doing. <laughs> Oliver, you've been um, quite um, prolific on this, on this subject. Uh, there, if you listen to, to Boris Johnson and, and his front bench at the moment, they, they are leaving no stone unturned. They're getting really tough. There's new bills going through, new laws. That these kleptocrats have nowhere to hide. Um, is that what's going on, Oliver? <laughs> yeah, I think I think the problem's solved, isn't it? I think um, this was... Uh, no, I, it's, it's a... It, I, I have to say, I mean, the government has been really leaving no stern unturned with the production of, of gimmicks. Um, I think their gimmickry has been world-class, world-leading. Um, my particular favourite gimmick is, is the fact that Ukrainian refugees are going to be housed in the mansions of oligarchs in West London, um, which is so ludicrous. I mean, we didn't even house bombed out EastEnders in mansions in West London during the Blitz. The idea that somehow this country is going to summon up the moxie to challenge the ownership rights of people in, who have mansions in West London. It's just so ridiculous. But yet out, out it goes and it's picked up and, 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 and run out, you know, in the headlines we have cancelling golden visas. Golden visas are cancelled. Look, look, look what good we're doing. I mean, the, the main problems with golden visas happened seven, eight, nine years ago. All of those people have now got British citizenship. You know, what it, no, it's not enough to cancel them. How, what are we doing to re-examine all the ones that were already issued? Absolutely nothing. Um, you know, the the Economic Crime Act, which was passed, I believe it received royal assent at one in the morning. So I can but hope that's an automated process and the Queen didn't have to be dragged from her bed in order to do that. Um, you know, that is it's not really an Economic Crime Act at all. It's a it's a transparency act. But it isn't re really even that because, you know, this is it is imposing supposedly transparency on offshore owned property in the UK. There are some almost 90,000 properties owned offshore by, by non-British companies in, in England and Wales. It's, it's a lot. Um, many of the uh, oligarchs who own property here hold them via offshore owned structures. But this law replicates all of the same problems that we've seen with our company's house in that the information that will be filed isn't verified. Even if you, so you can lie if you want to. Even if you want to tell the truth, it's extremely easy to avoid its uh, um, restrictions, because if, if, for example, you own your property, uh, not yourself, but, but via a company which has five equal shareholders, perhaps you and four close members of your family, then that comes, uh, technically no one owns that company. That is not, that you don't have to declare who owns it. If you own it via a trust, a professional trust provider, again, technically you don't own it. There are so many incredibly straightforward ways to avoid this law. But again, it is a, it's not even a paper tiger. It's, it's, it's a joke to be honest. I mean, it's, and, and it is very disappointing. As, as Peter said, it, it feels that a lot of, say, Rob, the, the approach of, of, of Robert Peston or, or, or the BBC, they're extremely good on the day-to-day -day stuff. You know, it's almost like that they're, they're minutely describing the ripples on the surface of the sea and doing a fabulous job of that. But they, but they somehow ignore the, the waves that underlie the ripples. And they don't step back and say, actually, you know, is this a, is this a, a big ripple? Or in the grand scheme of things, is this just a, a little bit of chop? And we really should be looking at this giant roller that it's on top of. You know, because, yes, as Peter says, the influence of money, the influence of the enabler class in, 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 in undermining efforts to do something about this. Because, you know, as Kojo says, you know, the, the empire is gone and yet mysteriously the money flows in the same channels that it did when we had an empire. It still comes from the same places and it ends up in London. So, you know, how, how is this happening without us apparently knowing? 
right? It it is it is a, an astonishing exercise in in you know the three monkeys, you know, seeing and hearing and speaking no evil all the time. It's it's it is in, incredibly disappointing. I mean, on the you know on the influence of money in politics. Just before I give someone else a chance to speak, you know, when I say when I wrote the book, you know, but the, the, wrote the title Butler to the World, it was a metaphor, right? But but actually, you know, the the chief Tory fundraiser is an actual butler. Um, you know, quintessentially is a concierge service. So you know, it's almost like you know the 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 reality. Um, overleap satire, you know, before I even managed to get the satire out the door, to be honest. Yeah, thank you. Someone in, in the chat just mentioned uh, Ben and, and Elliot as well. And, and for all that pessimism, this actually is a moment of opportunity. Where pe- th- there is more attention and focus on this than ever, than ever before. And um, you're right that the, the production of sound, of sound bites and, and, and gestures is something we have to be very aware of and, and cognizant of. Um, but on the other hand, in these moments, there are opportunities to actually get things done. I, I personally am very encouraged to see a uh, movement on um, action to stop the legal harassment of journalists. Now, of course, the devil will be in the detail there. You know, is that another set of empty headlines and, and promises? Is, is that consultation real? What, what will that really look like? Um, but obviously, um, at Open Democracy, we've got plenty of experience of attempted vexatious, vexatious lawsuits. Um, many of our colleagues, Carol Cadwallader, Catherine Belton, um, uh, Tom Burgess at the FT have all been targeted in this way. So I think there really is an opportunity there um, and I'm encouraged by it. And I'd love to hear, um, Peter, your thoughts on that. Um, but also um, what other things can be done in this moment, in this opportunity. And, and I'd like to hear you all, all speak to that one. I think there are some very technical things to do with uh, enforcement um, of existing laws, um, but also some far more structural things. So should, should we go first to defamation and libel and, and Peter just paint the picture of what it's like to operate as a journalist in this country writing about kleptocrats. Yes it's been, this has been one of the other kind of interesting aspects to see people talking about what we call slaps um, which if you grew up in rural Ireland like I did meant something totally different to strategic lawsuits against public participation and essentially that's uh, the way in which people who are rich and powerful can almost ruin your life by using the law as a strategic weapon against you. And we have defamation exists for a reason. It's important. People do deserve to be able to have their character protected. They, they should, you should not be able to tell lies about people. I think we all, every journalist pretty much worth their salt agrees with that. But the problem is we have a system in the UK that allows people to take what are essentially vexatious lawsuits because they can afford to do it. We have seen our court filled with them. And frankly, as journalists, it's very about two years ago, uh, no less, but a year ago, myself and, and, and you, Mary, we wrote, co wrote a piece talking about the time we were sued by a Democratic Unionist MP called Jeffrey Donaldson, who's now the leader of that party. And what was so interesting about that, the piece you know, went viral, lots of people were talking about it. And I think what we did was break a kind of journalistic omerta. We talked about something that happens a lot, but journalists don't talk about, which is the way in which the law is used to stop you doing work. And what's been kind of fascinating in the last week is to see that changing. You know, there, it has been a big sea change in some respects. We had Catherine Belton, Tom Burgess and others up before the Foreign Affairs Select Committee this week talking about that very thing. Tom Burgess won a, a case. A case was dropped by a, a Kazakh, the so-called Kazakh trio who were suing him in the UK. And what's interesting about that case um, is that, and this has happened before, the Kazakh trio were essentially suing Tom through a shell company in the UK because they didn't really have legal standing in the UK. And it's very easy, shows how easy it is to use the legal system here. You can set up a shell company and claim that your reputation has been impen- impugned through that and sue. But we are seeing some, hopefully, signs of light. Uh, of light. Today, Dominic Rabb is talking about actually not just having some sort of consultation and listening to people, but actually some sort of action on, uh, on SLAPs um, and but I think behind slaps is something that we has come up a bit in the last couple of weeks too, which is the entire legal profession's role in all of this. You know, we had a piece in Open Democracy recently from George Turner asking a very fair question about you know what's the legal profession's role in facilitating corruption. You know, if they are just handling, if they are being paid in the product proceeds of corruption, you know, there is should we be asking questions about that? It's very easy to say to rely on the taxi rank kind of philosophy of law, which I think we can all appreciate the idea that a lawyer comes, you know, has to, if a client goes to a lawyer, they should work for them. But there's a real issue in the UK, as we've seen with law firms who do huge amounts of work for people who are spending the product, the products of corruption. 
And you can see it when it comes to defamation case in particular. You know, I know when that who the law firms who I get letters through the door from are, are more often than not these days emails. And often they are very vexatious emails. I've had it recently where it's all about, you know, I there's no actually often there's no even expectation of taking a case against you. It's just using up your time. It's just taking up your energy. And frankly, it's also running up your bills because you're going to have to pay a lawyer to help you write your letters back. So it's hopefully there's a moment here for something to happen on this. It's been a long time coming. These, you know, in many ways, no one wants to hear about journalists saying they suffered in silence. But there has been an element in which that has happened with this, because a handful of you know investigative journalists in particular, but not just in the UK, around the world, have, have been dragged through the courts here in the UK and had that sort of Damocles hanging over them for a very long time, and nothing was done about it. There was up so many opportunities for action on this, as with many other issues that Oliver, in particular, has written about, and nothing was done. So there's something about this huge rush now to do something having read you know having showed no impetus at all for a very very long time i think one of the most pernicious things about the system is that um journalists can be sued individually as individuals so in the case of catherine belton tom burgess catherine had half collins behind her tom had um the ft but there are others who are sued personally um i, I will not forget you calling me peter and saying am i going to lose my house um it was it, and that is if if we can fix that I think that's something that as well that um, the public can, can understand. Like there's this big bully <laughs> and there's this journalist who's not even supported like, by the organisation they, they work for in the case of, of Carol Cadwallader, um, infamously. Um, and I think that if, if we can get movement on that particular issue, that particularly pernicious um, thing, I think, I think we could be moving um, really in the right direction. But it's a great, it's a great example of... Um, the vast gulf between the self-image of this country as this bastion of free speech and this feral press and this fearless fleet street and, and the reality, um, which is that um, journalists are cowed into submission in ways that completely baffle Americans, for example. Um, so I was, I, was, I was curious, Kojo, to, to um, come back to the structural question, right? So the, the gap between our self-perception and our, our story, our national story, the sto stories we tell, and, and reality. And I'm wondering where you see opportunities to potentially challenge and close that gap in this moment as well. Um, absolutely. I think that, you know, the narrative of... UK being this kind of bastion of free speech, we, I think that's been another kind of identity politics topic of the kind of war on free speech that we're getting through cancel culture and through these other culture war issues. But we don't really touch upon the use of the UK's really stringent libel laws to intimidate journalists like yourself and Peter have just mapped out. And I think that reform around that or reform around the public understanding of that could go step by step with a change in our understanding of how our legal and financial institutions in case, using the words of a political economist, Quinn Slobodian, this idea of encasing wealth from the democratic demands that were expanded throughout the world in that era of decolonization. I think thinking about the offshore world as connected to changes that happened in the onshore world and one of the most significant changes on the offshore world, onshore world is the transition of almost three quarters of the globe from a position of colonial subjugation into being independent states, that was a massive transformation in the 20th century, which we largely ignore in the United Kingdom, even though the UK played a leading role in this particular historical moment. But then when we want to look at issues like the emergence of the offshore world, we want to think about how can we reframe the public understanding of Britain's relationship to places like the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands? We often talk about them in the media as these distant tropical paradises that wealth escapes to and there's nothing that we can do about them. When in reality, these are British territory just as much as, you know, a Sheffield or a Swansea, as I say in that article. And so, and we know that Britain has intervened in these territories when we look at the intervention of the Chagos Islands or the Turk and Caicos Islands, and so Westminster has the will to be able to intervene in their domestic policies as and when it wants to. And so if we try and reframe the public understanding of these, these, these territories concerned to the British public, then I think we can also start thinking about the broader question of, well, what country do we want to be like? And I think that that's what needs to sit underneath the sanctioning and economic crime act and some of these actions that the government are trying to take in response to the Russian oligarchs there needs to be a broader question of 
well, if Britain has transitions in this role of being the butler of the world, then what conversation about what kind of country do we want to be should we have? You know, and this comes down to things around our constitutional structure, our laws around property, all of these different elements that could have been discussed in that era of decolonization, but were placed into the back burner because it was so much more convenient and so much more lucrative to transition into this role of facilitating wealth all across the world. And so I think that broader conversation is one that we really need to try and encourage and hopefully the greater attention on offshoring and Britain's particular role in that industry that we're getting with the Russian oligarch conversation could be the invitation to that. Yeah, I completely agree. There's, there's a need to um, reframe this conversation and, and to kind of leverage patriotism for something positive. Um, I work for an organization that says it, it's, it's there to build vibrant and inclusive democracies. And I think that that, that negative, if it's all, look at all this mess we've created everywhere and look at the ways that we've lied and cheated and stolen. And that's very disempowering. <laughs> um, it's, it's very, I mean, it, it absolutely is important to recognize this and, and to bring in reforms, laws, enforcement that stop this happening. But there's that, what, what does this country actually want to be? Who do we want to be? What does a, what does a vibrant, inclusive British democracy look like piece of this? Um, which I think is, is super important and, and, and gets lost, gets lost particularly in, in these moments. Um, having recognized that, I do think that there are some um, very practical things um, that we probably do need to be legislating and pushing forward uh, right now. Uh, and, and again, a lot of questions that were submitted ahead of time, um, which, which, go, which go to these points, um, what would be most effective in terms of sanctions, in terms of laws, in terms of enforcement? And so Oliver, I wanted to come back to you because you had a good critique of, of um, what's not being done, um, but what do you think could be sub substantively done that would really make a difference in this moment? Um, thanks, Mary. I know I think it's really important, obviously, to, to come up with some positive suggestions rather than just to throw rocks at the greenhouse. Um, you know, there, there are two ways of doing this. We can either you know what what we want to do is to is to empower law enforcement regulators to check the origin of this wealth to prevent the money getting here so it can pollute our country and also to 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 prevent people stealing it right if you don't if you can't keep money you won't steal it in the first place so this is a way of of both improving the uk and also improving the countries where the money comes from because it won't be stolen in the first place so you know firstly that you know the anti slap type rules is it's not just good for because it prevents us journalists being harassed it also produces information that feeds into other investigations you know that, that those investigations might be by due diligence firms or they might be by law enforcement but then it becomes a you know a virtuous circle the more information that's out there into corruption the better we understand it the more it can be investigated the more it can be prosecuted um so in order to do that yes we need to i mean uh, caroline keen who is who was uh, Catherine Belton and Tom Burgess's solicitor. She has this idea, it's a very simple idea, just a public interest guillotine in libel cases. At the very beginning, a judge can just say, no, this is in the public interest, this stops now. You know, the, the person can have a right of reply, but there is no admission of guilt. That's it. You know, if, if it's two footballers want to have a go at each other in court, by all means, spend millions and millions of pounds. But if you're an oligarch, you don't get to muzzle the journalist. That's it, boom, it stops. I think that's a brilliant idea. Very simple, very easy to do. And, 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 and would maintain the right that, you know, people do have a right to sue for libel. Second one, proper transparency. So companies house reform, offshore ownership reform. So you know who owns what and, and verified information. It's not enough just to have a, a fabulous database, which is full of rubbish. We need verified information that everyone can see and everyone can trust that information. And that, again, becomes the bedrock of investigations, <laughs> which feeds further into that sort of smart reforms. But we need to recognise that we we disastrously under enforce law enforcement in this country um we have a new economic crime levy coming in which will raise more money for law enforcement which is good but you know it's about it's going to be about 100 million pounds a year you know we spend about 900 million pounds a year on counter-terrorism work every year you know kleptocracy is as serious as terrorism if not more serious as a threat to national security and as a, and as a threat to global stability look at what vladimir putin is doing that is something that we need to be resourcing as well as we resource fighting terrorism, if not more so. And, you know, there are, I, I would I would argue that we need, you know, a, a, a centralised commissioner, someone to bring all the different agencies together to really coordinate this fight, to show, to, show, to really knock people's heads together and, and stop it running into sort of the political ground. Someone who can really force that. And, and the final point that we need is one thing that we, I think, lack in this country that other countries have is 
is a, a, a diversity of political scrutiny. Everything is very centralised in Westminster. The House of Commons is in charge. The House of Lords, let's face it, is, you know, it tries. But I think the moment when we gained a baron of Siberia is the moment when the House of Lords really jumped the shark. Um, it's time we need, you know, I, I've spoken a lot to Elise Bean, who worked for the Senate Subcommittee of Investigations in the United States. Um, you know, they did extraordinary work exposing, um, you know, bad behaviour in America and elsewhere, you know, with really forensic subpoena powers. It would be so good if our parliamentary commissions had those kind of, of powers, those kind of, of that kind of, of bravado to really go after those cases and with a with a proper you know independent house of lords which also had committees it would again produce information which would feed into you know the 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 mill of and you gain this virtuous circle which which then you know there are so many people in the national crime agency or the serious fraud office or the met or or wherever who are incredibly frustrated with the situation as it is now you know that we have this you know the, they're they're under resourced they're they're demoralized you know, they don't have the political cover. Anyone who spends five years in the National Crime Agency is just broken by the end of it. And they think, sod it, they go and work for an oligarch or go and work for a bank. You know, why stay? If no one else is taking it seriously, why should they take it seriously? Um, and, and, and the point is to get those people, to empower those people, to really change things around. You know, I, I think it's, uh, um, you know, I, um, I don't know. I think, I think that, that this is an opportunity. This is a moment. And we need to make sure that that, that we really yeah, use it and, and take a full advantage. Well, we are promised a, a second economic crime bill, um, you know, and uh, I was trying to think of examples of a, of a sequel, which is better than the original um, and was really struggling. You know, I mean, okay, Godfather 2 is as good as Godfather 1, but in general, Back to the Future 2, disaster area, and so it goes on. And then someone said to me, Paddington, Paddington 2 is better than Paddington 1. So our aim is to make the economic crime bill the, the legislative equivalent of Paddington 2. And, um, and if we can do that and make it better than the original, we will really have done extremely well. Um, or I really hope that there isn't a, a third, a, a trilogy, but um, Stephen Kinsella points out that Toy Story 3 was also by far the best of all the four Toy Stories, and I've watched them all. <laughs> but let's try and nail it on number two, yeah? <laughs> Thank you also for um, mentioning uh, the esteemed Lord Lebedev. Um, Jim Kusick, um, who's a veteran political reporter, has done a lurid line of reporting on Evgeny Lebedev and his relationship with Boris Johnson for open democracy, which I'm sure our colleagues will, will share in the chat. That is, that is quite a tale. Um, uh, but I, I think your point is well made. Um, you, you also touched on how Americans do this better. And I think this is something that, um, that came up in the questions as well. And so I wanted to ask you a quick follow-up on that, Oliver. I mean, that it's partly what can we learn from that example? Um, um, from how US law, law enforcement does this, and I'm not saying that you know they don't cause problems all over the world too. <laughs> um, but in this in this particular in this particular um, specific area, what, what can we learn? And also how to create the political public policy pressure and momentum. And there, I think actually once again, um, pressure from US counterparts is probably one of the few levers that might actually be effective um, for this government. So I was going to ask about that, but also how else, how else to create um, this, this, this pressure for, for the specific types of change that are needed? Uh, yeah, part of the issue is, um, you know, the history of the City of London going back to the 1950s, the, the, the post-colonial role of the City of London is to be less regulated than Wall Street. That's what it does. That's what it's for. This is where the money goes if it's too dirty for Wall Street. It's where you go if you want to dodge taxes and regulations on Wall Street. That is something we're going to, it's going to be very hard to get over. In, in, in Butler to the World, I tell the story of the, the attempt by a small but, but mighty group of Scottish MPs to force through improvement on the rules of Scottish limited partnerships, the, the shell companies used to move billions and billions of dollars out of the former Soviet Union. That, that ran aground and sank on the opposition of the City of London to further regulations. It's going to be very, very hard. Um, but if you look at US law enforcement, and you know, as you say, the, you know, they, the America has many, many problems with money and politics, which make ours look like, you know, a dinghy compared to the Titanic, you know, but in terms of law enforcement, they have multiple different, le you know, it is not centralized in one place, they have multiple, you know, power structures, multiple competing uh, prosecutors offices. Um, and, and, and the Department of Justice has a sufficient budget to really go after big people and levy huge if you are investigating financial crime, you're investigating and confiscating money. And the Crown Prosecution Service is already starting this in a small way with some civil recovery proceedings, which is a new thing for them. 
So, you know, there are tentative steps in this direction because, you know, it's generally reckoned, and I don't think this is contentious, that every pound invested in um, civil recovery of criminal assets, you know, brings back nine pounds in profits. You know, so this is, it's actually quite a good way of making money for law enforcement and it becomes self-sustaining. But you just need to have that initial political courage to get over the hump of saying, you know, what happens to the City of London if we actually start enforcing the laws? You know, does the City of London go pop? And, and, and recognise that actually enforcing the laws is, is, is what's going to keep us all in business as a democracy. If we don't enforce the laws, then, you know, how, you know what's the point? You know, why carry on, really? You mentioned um, the exorbitant price of paying to play in US politics, um, which is something that just boggles everyone's mind everywhere else in the world. Um, but Peter's made this point, I think you made it in your book, Peter, and many of the pieces I've, I've, I've read that you've written, that actually um, there's a converse problem here, which is it's so cheap to play. I mean, for 50 grand, you can get dinner with the British Prime Minister. And that creates its own set of problems, which is arguably worse. Um, I don't know. I think I won't. You know, I don't know which of those systems I prefer. But Peter, did you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, but that's that is one of the remarkable things we see about British politics. It really is so cheap. And I remember when I first started writing these stories, it was like, well, it can't really matter because you know American presidential election. I think the last one was something like five billion dollars off the top of my head, and the last UK general election was about a hundred million. So you're like, yeah, you can't make that big of a difference. But actually, it's the exact opposite. Because there's so little money, because the closed loop is so small, it's the same problem. But actually, in Britain, the parties are scrambling over the few people who give money as well. We have a different philanthropic culture. In, in America, there is a kind of giving culture, whereas in Britain, there isn't a giving culture. So if people are giving money to political parties, it's often because they want something. You know, we did, a, we did an investigation um, back in, in, I think it was November with the Sunday Times, you know, and exposed that, you know, three million pounds is a going rate if you're a Tory treasurer for a seat in the House of Lords. Every single Tory treasurer, I think bar one had accepted a seat in the House of Lords, having hit this three million pound seating and then moved on. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to Mr. Elliot, the butler to the entire world, uh, and uh, from quintessentially after that. But yeah, but in, in often it's less than three million pounds too. We saw Richard Desmond, the, uh, the, is he still the owner of the Daily Express, that, um, that, that August, um, August publication? And, and he had, um, a planning decision was overturned on his behalf after he sat next to the planning minister, uh, Robert Jenrick, at a Tory fundraiser. So he paid £8,000 and got 50 million quid back, basically, for a planning decision to be overturned. And a government minister was asked about this in the radio a few days after, as I remember listening, and he said, but there's no problem with this. Anyone can spend £8,000 and have dinner sitting next to a minister. And that is a system we have in this country in which, frankly, small amounts of money can buy huge, huge, huge amounts of influence. We see it time and again. And until something is done about that, and until something is done about this connection, because, you know, in many ways, until a couple of years ago, I think we could all have been slightly blinded to this too. There might be, OK, maybe it isn't as bad as that. But, you know, I remember when I first started reporting back in April 2020 on COVID contracts, and I continued reporting on that story for almost two years, we can see the connections between what were VIPs, very important people, and politically connected firms winning or 10 times more likely to be given COVID contracts. These are huge, hundreds of million pounds in some instances, COVID contracts. So we know that money makes a difference in our politics, but yet... One thing the politicians seem to have no interest whatsoever in just to flag the election bill that's going through Parliament at the moment will do nothing to stop this flow of money into our politics. Absolutely nothing. You're still going to be able to donate, even if you're offshore, to British political parties. And you're still going to be able to set up a company, which I think is so ridiculous. Even if you're not allowed to be a political donor, you can set up a shell company for £15 on the internet in five minutes and donate to politics through that. Thank you for mentioning the elections bill. That's really one that gets my blood boiling, having reported from the US state of Georgia and, and reported on the US elections and uh, seen just how hard certain red states make for it for certain communities to vote. And this voter ID provision is just, it just sickens me. There is no evidence that it's needed whatsoever. And it is absolutely straight from the racist Republican playbook. Um, particularly deployed in the South. And it's just going it, it to, is, it is so detrimental to our democracy and there is absolutely no justification for it whatsoever. And I just don't understand how anyone could have got that idea from anywhere else apart from the, the source I just named. So um, taking a moment to channel that anger, I'm going to come back to Kojo um, and ask him to conclude with some positive thoughts 
but 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 more um more substantively the, the point you made about the, the conversation we have to have about what kind of a country do we want to be um where do you see their hope um what, what what does that conversation look like? How do you think it can engage and inspire people? And, and where, if anywhere, do you actually see that happening? Where do you see that the potential for it to grow? I mean, conversations like this, I think, are a real source of optimism, a real source of hope in terms of how we might broaden the understanding of Britain's role within the wealth inequality that has corroded democracy, not just in the global south, but we're now seeing very much here at home, you know, stories around foreign investment and capital flight and their impact on corona democracy used to be seen as simply a problem for the developing world, for the old third world. But now we're starting to see a lot of these conversations right here in the United Kingdom. And I think that paying attention to those and realizing the way in which Britain becoming this offshore playground for oligarch wealth has corroded the living standards of not just people in Russia, not just people in Nigeria, not just people all around the world, but right here in the United Kingdom. Um, the um, invitation to this particular talk, I thought entitled, um, Can Britain Break Its Addiction to um, Dirty Money? I thought was interesting because it made me think, well, who is addicted to, to, to money? Um, it, you know, obviously, yes, if you are a city lawyer, if you're maybe an investment banker, if you are one of our exclusive boarding schools, if you're a luxury estate agent, they've been pretty addicted to this global oligarch wealth. But a teacher who's unable to afford houses because asset prices in London have escalated beyond the ability for everyday people to afford, they're not pretty addicted to these oligarch wealth. And I think rearranging those um, ideas around political allegiance, rearranging the narrative around corruption, which I think, as you mentioned, has been so heavily racialized in our public discourse. Um, Peter earlier mentioned David Cameron and... Um, you know, his controversy with Greensill. And that made me think about his famous video of speaking to the Queen, where he describes the um, diplomats coming over from Nigeria and Afghanistan as with, you know, they're coming from fantastically corrupt countries. And so that idea of, well, you know, his, his record with Blairmore Holdings and the way in which that was involved in the entire Panama, Panama Papers conversation, his relationship with Greensill. Is this not what we want to think about when we are discussing this problem of corruption all across the world? Um, reshifting those political allegiances, reshifting that political frame, I think really does open up opportunities for new, new alliances, new ideas around what happens in the global south, what happens in the developing world, and how does that impact us right here in London? You know, we might think about um, kleptocrats and foreign autocratic owners who are accumulating and extracting wealth from their countries, not just simply as a civilizational problem of these developing countries that, you know, it's a shame and we feel bad for them, but it doesn't really impact on our lives here in London or in Glasgow. When we look at the actual chain of that finance, we look at where it ends up, when we look at how it corrodes democracy, not just there, but also here in London, I think that that makes us start to look at those places and their issues in a new light. And for me, that gives me a little bit of hope for, like I said, new political allegiances. Thank you. And to pick up a point in the chat as well, I think, uh, and some questions that were asked earlier, what can we all do? And I do think that there is a moment um, for us as citizens um, to push our elected representatives uh, to make election pledges um, to, uh, to stand on this issue in, in subsequent elections and, and having that longer term uh, time frame on this. Another thing that maybe isn't a source of hope, but um, certainly of courage and admiration and solidarity is, I would really encourage you all to read um, Open Democracy's coverage of, of the Ukraine war. They're, they're working really hard with people who are taking um, on, you know, unspeakable risks on the ground to, to bring you the stories and the perspectives of, of what's really happening. Um, uh, in that war and in that in that desperate situation, so um, and they're publishing it in Russian too. A lot of a lot, a lot of this, which I think is so important, is in this new kind of hybrid information warfare. Um, thank you to all my panelists so much. This has been a really rich conversation. Um, you do, if you do not already have a copy of Uncommon Wealth or Democracy for Sale or Butler to the World, um, go to any reputable bookshop, not Amazon, and avail yourself of copies. <laughs> and um,
Thank you. Thank you to everyone who listened in and participated. Um, and please tune in again ne next week. <laughs>